Calvin Lucian stands at the end of a dusty table in an abandoned warehouse. In the shadows across from him sit several hidden figures. The warehouse is falling apart, but is suitable for the meeting Calvin has requested with the heads of the Chaos Insurgency. He has completed numerous missions for the organization, and each one has been successful. Now he is proposing one final mission. Calvin Lucian takes a tattered journal out of his bag and slides it across the table to the figure sitting in the shadows. It's a journal, with details on the habits of each of the 13 Foundation Overseers, he says. There is silence from the other end of the table. A hand reaches out and grabs the journal. The pages begin to turn. The new models indicate an anomalous catastrophe is imminent. Not even the Foundation can stop it. The only way to save the world is to kill the Overseers. There are whispers from across the table as Calvin continues. The proliferation of anomalies in the world are the fault of the Overseers. They have been meddling with reality. If business continues as usual, we might not make it out of the 2020s. We need to act now. The whispering from the shadows resumes, this time with what seems to be a little more urgency. One of the voices asks the question on everyone's mind. How do you plan to kill the Overseers? They have a deal with death. They are immortal. Calvin smiles and takes out a small vial from his jacket pocket. With this, he says, there is a silence from the shadows. The journal slides back across the table and comes to a stop right in front of Calvin. A deep voice from the shadows says, Do it. Calvin Lucian gathers his team. The codename given to the group is Kill Squad. He informs them that they've been cleared to take out the Overseers. It will be the most dangerous mission they've ever been on, and even if successful, they probably won't make it out alive. But the team is loyal. They set out to confront the 13th Overseer. This has to be their first stop because without eliminating 05-13, nothing else will matter. It is this Overseer who has a deal with death, a deal that protects all of the Foundation Overseers from dying. If that deal can be broken, then Calvin Lucian and his team will have a shot at eradicating the other Overseers. If the deal with death cannot be broken, all is lost. The team boards a ship at the tip of South America and sails towards the frozen waters of Antarctica. The kill squad is made up of Calvin and three others. They sit in the galley preparing for the mission ahead. Anthony Wright is a battle-hardened soldier who sits at one end of the table. His face is covered with scars. No one can remember when he first joined the insurgency, because it was so long ago. Next to him is Olivia Torres. She is an anarchist who was recruited into the insurgency after she was liberated from a Foundation site during a raid. Adam Ivanov sits staring into his computer screen. He is testing different gadgets that might be of use on the mission. He pushes his glasses up the bridge of his nose and strikes the enter key. A long line of code begins to scroll across the screen. A siren begins to sound, informing the crew to make their way to the main deck. When they surface from the bowels of the ship, they see something in the distance. It is a giant black tower rising from the depths of the ocean like an evil iceberg. Waves crash over the side of the railings, drenching the deck and crew with frigid water. Calvin looks at the jagged rocks along the shore of the tower. There is no way to safely dock. There is only one way onto the island. They know what needs to be done. Anthony waits for the next wave, then opens the throttle to full. The ship is carried towards the island on the crest of the wave. The hull is impaled on the rocks surrounding the tower, sending everything flying towards the front of the boat. See? That wasn't so bad, Calvin says to his team as he bandages a gash on his hand. Knowing what lays ahead, Calvin orders his team to wait on the ship while he makes his own deal with death. He enters the dark structure and is greeted by a corpse. The corpse speaks to him, ejecting dust from its lungs with every word. Its breath smells like decaying flesh. Death has inhabited the body of Dr. Felix Carter, the 13th Overseer. Calvin is prepared, though thanks to the notes in the journal he possesses. Without hesitating, he takes out a small bottle of liquid from his pocket and lunges at the corpse. He grabs it by the neck, tilts the head back, and pours liquid down what is left of the throat of Felix Carter. The corpse reanimates into the living Dr. Carter. Death has been removed from his body by liquid from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin had acquired on a previous raid on a Foundation site. Seeing that Dr. Carter is now alive, Calvin takes out his pistol and shoots the doctor twice, killing him. Calvin picks up the body and throws it into a bottomless pit at the base of the tower. Dr. Felix Carter's body disappears from sight. The Overseer's deal with death is now broken. They are vulnerable and can be killed 
at last. Calvin smiles and begins to turn away from the pit when he comes face to face with death. She stands with her head cocked to the side looking at Calvin. So it is you who has broken the Overseer's deal with me, Calvin Lucian. Calvin takes a step back. Why didn't she stop him from killing Felix Carter? Something festers at the heart of the Council, Death says. Something that will not die. I thought that perhaps if I had a seat at their table, I could find it, make it die. But I couldn't. There are things in this world beyond even my reach, Calvin Lucian. With that parting thought, Death vanishes. The Kill Squad contacts the Insurgency for an evac and then makes their way to Japan, where 05-12, also known as the Accountant, has been working out of Tokyo. He is so proficient in mathematics and probability that he can actually predict the future. Everything about the Accountant's life, down to the number of breaths and steps he takes each day, is predetermined, based on his own statistical models. This poses a problem for Calvin and his team. If the Accountant can see them coming, then how can they possibly kill him? That night, the Accountant steps out of his car, he looks to the left and spots Adam. He has already predicted this man has hostile intentions. The accountant walks directly towards Adam and before he can react, throws the kill squad member to the ground. Then he turns slightly and adjusts his watch, sending a glare directly into the window where Anthony has the accountant in his sights of his sniper rifle. Anthony fires, but misses due to being blinded by the glare. The accountant is surprised that he just barely had time to avoid being shot. Normally, he would be several steps ahead of anyone trying to kill him. He turns his head and watches as Olivia helps Adam up and they run down a nearby alley. The accountant pursues them and corners the kill squad members in the alley. He pulls a gun to shoot Adam, but Olivia tackles Adam behind a dumpster as the bullet hits the wall directly behind where Adam was standing. The accountant can't believe that he missed and that he was almost tricked into being captured by the insurgency team. He senses uncertainty in his assailant's actions and runs away unable to predict exactly what they are planning to do. The accountant climbs the stairs to a subway station and boards the last car of the train. It is empty except for one man, Calvin Lucian. The accountant is dumbfounded. How are you here? He screams. I should have seen this coming. Calvin stands up. He uses his thumb to flip a coin into the air. On the way down, he grabs it and smacks it on the back of his opposing hand. Calvin smiles. The team has been making their decisions based on the flip of a coin, which introduced randomness into their actions that even this super advanced mathematician could not account for. Tell me where 05-11 is, demands Calvin. The accountant pauses, then shakes his head no. If he's going to die either way, then why give any information to the kill squad? Calvin flips the coin up in the air, catches it, and looks at it. The coin is face up. Calvin lifts his pistol and shoots the accountant in the head. A few nights later, Olivia stands on a balcony outside of an art exhibit overlooking the city of Seattle. Anthony walks up behind her and tells her that the Foundation is defeated, but Olivia doesn't understand how. We broke the Overseer's deal with death and killed the accountant. There's nothing more to do. We can go back to our normal lives, he tells her. Olivia is skeptical, though. What about the 11th Overseer and his ability to... Olivia's eyes suddenly go wide. She pulls out a knife and stabs it into Anthony's heart. The world around her begins to distort and fall apart. It was a false reality created by 05-11, better known as The Liar. Olivia wakes up next to Adam in a hotel room. She sits up in a bed and rubs her eyes. What a weird dream, she thinks. Then she realizes it wasn't a dream. She shakes Adam awake. Neither of them have any idea how they ended up here, but they know it must be the doing of The Liar. They had planned for this, though. With Calvin having created a contingency plan, they pull out a laptop and log in to view the classified information Calvin left for them. Olivia begins to type but stops halfway through her password and looks up from the screen. Olivia pulls out the gun that rests under her pillow and shoots at him. The false reality created by the liar falls apart around her. Olivia comes out of the previous lie and is sitting across the table from Calvin. She immediately draws her pistol and points it at Calvin's head. Is it really him? or just another one of the liar's games. Calvin tries to talk Olivia down and she looks around the room for inconsistencies that might tip her off that this is another lie, but doesn't find any. Olivia begins to relax. She tells Calvin that the liar is trying to get something from her. Maybe the journal can tell them what he is looking for, as long as she still has it. Olivia nods her head and holds out her wrist where a subdermal chip with a copy of the journal on it has been placed. Calvin looks at her wrist. The world around them begins to dissipate as Calvin morphs into the liar. Olivia wakes up in a hospital where she is hooked up to an IV. Sitting across from her is a former insurgency agent named Sam Veal. He explains to her that he is the liar. 
He was forced into becoming a monster by the Foundation. They had manipulated him, but now he is tired of running and can't do it anymore. She is free to go. Olivia hesitantly unhooks herself from the IV. She walks out of the hospital room and proceeds down a fluorescent lit hallway. As she walks away, she hears a gunshot from the hospital room. As Olivia is in the hospital, Calvin and Adam walk through a dense forest. They are searching for 05-10. The journal indicates that the 10th Overseer's identity within the Foundation is the Archivist. In the middle of the clearing are two saplings standing side by side. The void between the saplings shimmers. Calvin walks through the portal and the space begins to warp and twist around him. His vision finally comes back into focus and Calvin finds himself in another world. Adam enters the world behind Calvin, practically knocking him over as he enters through the portal. This is the Wanderer's Library, but it doesn't look anything like they expected. Instead of rows of books, the library is filled with computer mainframes, humming with the collected knowledge of how to contain anomalies, a critical backup. As the two look intently at the strange machines, a figure in a silver robe suddenly steps out of the darkness. It's tall and thin, and though its hood is pulled down so they can't see its face, they can see that its hands are covered in scales that have a slight emerald tint. It is one of the librarians. Calvin tells the librarian that they are seeking the archivist, but the librarian tells them that the archivist is no longer in the library. She has broken her pact with the serpent and eaten fruit from the forbidden trees. If they want to see her, though, the librarian can take them to her. Calvin and Adam follow the librarian down a long staircase, passing by countless doors filled with books, scrolls, works of art, and an entire universe of knowledge. Eventually, they reach the bottom of the stairs where there stands a giant set of brass doors. Beyond the door, the librarian explains, is the source of all knowledge. Before Calvin and Adam pass through the doors, though, Calvin turns to the librarian. Before we go in, I'd like to make a withdrawal, he says. The librarian nods and pulls out a silver tube out of its robe. It hands the tube to Adam, and he looks it over in his hands. He looks up to ask what this is, but the librarian has vanished. The door then opens, and the two step through. Calvin and Adam feel as if they walk through the same kind of portal that brought them to the library, and find that they have walked into a lush green valley with two trees. Sitting underneath one of them is a woman in a white dress. She is reading a book and eating a piece of fruit. Are you the archivist? Calvin asks. The woman nods yes, and that's all the confirmation Calvin needs. He raises his pistol and fires, but the bullet passes right through the archivist as if she wasn't there. Do you read? The archivist asks Calvin, seemingly not phased by his attempts to shoot her. I haven't had much time recently, Calvin replied. The archivist explains that she's read every book in the library. The collected knowledge of the universe is in the books, even one on how to allow bullets to pass through your body. She came here to find the secret to immortality. It's her job to document everything that happens in the world, and she can't do that if she's dead. She explains that she figured out that the fruit that the serpent forbade everyone to eat wasn't actual fruit, but the knowledge contained in the library. By having read every book, she has consumed the fruit. She no longer needs the serpent, because she was the serpent. The archivist falls to the ground and begins to writhe around, contorting her body as it starts to change. She begins to elongate as her limbs seemingly disappear. The next thing Calvin and Adam know, they are face to face with a giant snake. Calvin dodges as the serpent lunges at him and Adam stands in the doorway, firing at the snake with his pistol. But just like with the archivist's human form, the bullets have no effect. The serpent coils around Calvin and begins to choke the life from him as Adam can only watch helpless. Calvin cries out with his last breath. The tube, Adam! Open the tube! Adam takes the tube that was given to him by the librarian and opens the cap. A long, heavy spear slides out that looks much too large to have ever fit inside. He drops the tube to the ground and watches in amazement as it starts to transform, turning into what looks like a large harpoon gun. Adam knows what to do and places the giant spear into the gun and points it at the serpent. You can't kill me, the giant snake says. I've eaten from the tree of life. Adam pulls the trigger and the huge spear flies through the air striking the serpent in the head. 
Adam runs to Calvin and helps him to his feet. They turn to look at the snake, but instead of the menacing creature, it's the archivist once again, pinned against the tree she once sat under, the spear sticking out of her skull. As the two stand, looking at the archivist, a tall, hooded, humanoid figure steps out from behind the tree. It looks similar to the librarian, except its robe is a greenish color and it wears long black gloves. The creature pulls the spear out of the archivist, whose body slumps to the ground and hands the spear to Calvin. Who are you? Calvin asks, but his question is ignored. After a moment, the figure finally speaks. That spear you now hold is called the Spear of the Non-Believer. It is an ancient weapon used to kill gods. It is odd that someone in this realm gave you the spear. Even with it, I am not sure you will be able to complete your quest, Calvin Lucian. But we shall see. There is a sudden flash of light, and Calvin and Adam find themselves transported back to the forest they had entered the Wanderer's Library from. A week later, Calvin and Anthony track down O5-9, who in the Council is known as the Outsider. She isn't hard to find, and it seems as if she actually wanted to be found. They find her sitting outside of her burnt-down family home. The journal had listed this as her address, but Calvin doubted that she would be here, and most he hoped to find a clue to her whereabouts. But here she was, sitting in the ashes of her home. Without turning around, the outsider began speaking. The council just used me, you know, she says. They took away my academic career, my friends, and my life. They made me conduct research for them that compromised everything I stood for, and now here I am with nothing. The outsider lets out a sigh. She asks Calvin if he's afraid of death. Calvin shakes his head and responds, No. The outsider slumps forward and Calvin walks around to face her. She is covered in blood. Her eyes move to look up at Calvin. You're lying, she says as she dies from self-inflicted wounds. Calvin and Anthony cross 05-9 off the list and head back to the car. As they walk, Anthony says what's been on everyone's minds the last few days. The easy part is done. We'll only get harder from here. We know 05-8 is in his castle. I'm sure we'll get in, but I'm not sure if we'll make it out alive. I know, replies Calvin. But if we're going to save the world, we must eliminate the rest of the overseers, even if it means sacrificing our own lives. They get in the car and drive off into the blood-red sunset to pick up the rest of the Kill Squad team before their next mission.